those of us that are watching online, we welcome you this evening. And, you know, you had the privilege of having my husband here last, last week. And so you get me. I'm sorry. That might disappoint just a little bit, but <laughs> you guys are so encouraging. You're so encouraging. Um, well, we have the privilege of bringing to you Isaiah, and he covered just a few chapters. And so actually right before service, Pastor Lynn was kind of laughing about it because he said that I got left with like 60 some chapters. That sounds about right. Um, my husband, although um, he would love to be here, he is here online. He's actually in San Diego. Everybody can be like, boo, because he gets to enjoy the lovely sunny weather, but he's actually out there with our, our older one. And so... Um, Although he's not here, he, he is here with us in spirit. So, you know, um, last week he, he set us up really well for Isaiah. And, you know, over the years, that's kind of how we work a little bit is he sets up and then um, I, get to, I get to take over or vice versa and I'll set up and then he gets to take over and we always kind of do a handoff. I just wasn't expecting so many chapters in Isaiah. But um, don't, not to worry, we're not going to cover um, all 60, but I am going to try um, my hardest to bring to you what I believe that God has put on me for this evening um, with the book of Isaiah. You know, when we think of the book of Isaiah, a lot of times we think of that as the, the prophecy of Jesus, the prophecy of our Messiah. And although that is some of what I'm going to um, share with you, I want to really... Um, one, I'm going to highlight a few things from last week, but then I also want to express to you how God's word is. You know, it's always what we hear is that the word is a type and shadow. We hear this when we talk about the comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that there's always types and shadows. And tonight, I want to bring to about just a little bit about that, because I want to share with you that although we read the Bible, and anybody doing the one-year Bible read? Yeah, we go through it in a chronological, you know, Genesis, and that's a beginning, and Revelation is an end. But really going through the Bible, once we, and this is our journey through the scriptures, right, is we start to see that the books of the Bible and the chapters, they build upon each other. The, it, it's not always where we think that, like the book of Isaiah is all the way over here, and then we had, you know, First and Second Kings over here, and then Chronicles. It actually builds upon. So some of the things that you hear and you read about in Zy Isaiah actually were talked about in, in Kings and in, in Chronicles. So although I'm not going to give you all of that, I just want to set us up for a little bit of a background, is that although there is a start and there's a finish to the Bible, right, his word is an ever-living word, right? It's, it's always living. And there's things that we can still apply today because our God is not governed by time. So when we look at things, although it might have been for a season, we also can see that we're in a season. Amen. The Bible itself is intertwined together. And so, you know, sometimes we can be like, oh, that was for, you know, those people. Well, those people were, you know, like before the promised land, you know. Those people that got stuck going round and round and round for 40 years when it really would have only taken them 11 days. You know, we always think of it as those people. But there are a lot of applicable things when we read the Bible that apply to us today. And so I'm going to just kind of share with you a little bit about that. As we looked in and we heard from last week, just a little bit of the backdrop is Isaiah was a man on a mission. Does anybody remember what his name means? You guys can participate a little bit. It's Wednesday night. Yes, he was salvation of the Lord is what his name means. The Lord has shown Isaiah a glimpse of his glorious throne and placed a call on Isaiah. See, Isaiah was a prophet in his time. He spoke God's word, but speaking God's word was unpopular at that time too. How many of us can relate that sometimes speaking God's word puts us in a little bit of a place where we're unpopular, right? 
There's people, and we understand that the word is offensive. It says that a word will offend. Well, let me just um, encourage you tonight and then also challenge you tonight that we're not called to be popular people. We're called to be a people of truth that stands on the truth that is to share the good news. Well, what's the good news? The gospel of Jesus. And it will offend. But that's okay. See, Isaiah had words that were of confrontation. He had words that were of exhortation and he had warnings. We can heed from some of the warnings. We can heed from some of the exhortations. Even when faced with opposition, Isaiah continued to stand up in truth. My call to you tonight is do we stand for truth? I know that in a world that's full of social media that there... There used to be a time, there isn't a time, but there used to be a time when people didn't have a voice. They didn't have a platform. Now we have a voice that's called Twitter and we have a voice that's called Facebook and we have a Twitter or a, a voice called Instagram. Those are the three top ones, but I've learned that there's a lot of other ones. But those, are, those have given room for a voice. That's not the truth. Can I tell you that tonight? that that's not the truth. The truth is, is it can be found on your phone. I'm just saying, because I am an iPhone user. I'm not an Android user. Sorry, I had to, I had to. We are, you know, Apple users in our house. You can find the truth in your, in your Bible app. I can tell you that. But we need to let the, the truth, the word of God dictate our lives and not the world standards of truth. The world standards of truth will have good being turned to evil and evil being turned to good. So even more in such a critical time when things are being so perverse, the word of God is being perverse, we need to stand on his, on his truth. That's what Isaiah was doing. The Lord had called Isaiah to warn people of their headlong, their reckless. They were reckless rush to disaster. The people, they, they, they were just like reckless. If you remember that last week, there was the, in the first few chapters, there was the, the comparison of Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? It was a very perverse cities and there was only one, one man that stood on the promises, one man that stood on the word of God. Lot and his family. But we, we see that in Isaiah and what he was talking about is he's talking to a people that God was comparing to that. In the book of Isaiah, there's two parts to it and I'm gonna kind of break it down a little bit. But the first part we see is we see the, the warning signs. But then there's the second part where we see the words of hope and of promise the hope and the promise of a Messiah, our, our Messiah, not a Messiah. Let's make it really tangible for us, but our Messiah. This was a prophecy that wouldn't come for another 700 years. But although it was a prophecy, we don't just say it as it was a prophecy of a Messiah, of one that would come and save, but it is our Messiah. He is the one that came and saved me. He's the one that came and saved you. He's the one that came and saved your neighbor. He's the one that came and saved your coworker. He's the one that will come and save, and you can fill in, right? 700 years prior to Jesus. Do you know what this number seven means? The number seven means perfection or completion. Now let's just put it into translation that it was 700 years. That number seven, it talks about completion, perfection. We even understand that in God's timing, it never looks like our timing. Although Isaiah may have prophesied something, it took years I'm not telling you that it's going to take 700 years for your, for your word that God may have promised you, but he does promise us things and it does come in generations and generations and generations. So although he may promise you something, hopefully we don't read about it 700 years later, right? Yeah. Amen. The book of Isaiah can be 
very overwhelming if you start to go into it. And I'm just going to share with you, it was a little bit. And how many know, we're talking about and singing about peace tonight. I can tell you that it, it felt a little bit chaotic today. And I had probably everything possible was going to hit me. Things that wouldn't normally on a normal day come my way, came my way today. But I had to draw back into that peace of no matter what's being around, no matter what's going on, I'm still like stable in, in God's word. But although it is overwhelming, there's a lot that is very enlightening. And there is so many similarities in the, in the Bible that Isaiah translates into as the Bible as a whole. So just to give you some background, this is kind of like free stuff, but this is Wednesday night. So we're, we're teaching a little bit, but how many knows how many books is in the Bible? Come on, church. 66. And there's 66 chapters in Isaiah. Yeah, you learned something, right? I hope you did. All right. Two parts, right? The first part emphasizes God's righteousness, his holiness, and justice, just as the Old Testament does. So the first part of Isaiah does the exact same thing as the Old Testament does of the Bible. Then when we move into chapters 40 through 66 of Isaiah, it turns the prophecy of God's future provision of salvation in Jesus. This is where we see the beginning. We start to understand the beginning of humanity's rebellion, okay, in the first part of the Bible, but we end with Jesus, our Savior. There's some comparison and some contrast here between, between the two. I'm not going to spend as much time on the first part of Isaiah as I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the second half of Isaiah, more on the, the hope and the provision and the understanding of who Jesus is, our Savior. Isaiah will talk about a holy God who will gain glory by judging sin and then restoring his people. Who is his people that he's talking about? Israel. then the, the New Testament does the exact same thing. Our God who is holy will gain glory by judging sin and saving those who call on the name of Jesus. Just some comparison so that you can go away and you can write some notes and go, oh, I learned two things tonight. That was for fun, guys. Come on, you can laugh. We know that in the very beginning of Isaiah, it talks about, and Isaiah was confronting the people of idolatry. See, the tribe of Judah was starting to resist God's will. And God wanted them to turn inwardly to look and see what idols they had. Not only then were they building idols that they carried, but there's also idols that they were holding in their, in their heart. That's exactly the same word that we can apply to today, is that God wants us to look inwardly at what idols we may be holding what is it that we have in our heart? What issues of the heart can we be holding? I know it sounds, it sounds a little different to, than to think of something that is more tangible, that you can see, that you can touch, that you can feel. But there is so many things that we hold and we place in our heart. There are things that we ask the Lord for and we don't always see right away. And so there becomes a, a part of our heart that starts to like, mm, we kind of back away just a little bit. And we start idolizing the problem more than we idolize the word of God and that he says yes and amen. He's trying to get our attention just as Isaiah was trying to get the attention of the people. God is calling us just as he was calling them. He was calling back his people. They just had to go through a lot. I mean, I don't want to go through a lot. I'm, I'm just saying. Now we go through a lot and then we complain and we talk about it and we make it sound like it's a lot, but I don't want to go through what they went through. Like they went through a lot. There's a lot of chapters of all that they went through. And we think that our, our individual battles... Yeah, I'm glad we don't live in that day. Amen. But God is calling us. And with his call, he calls, 
He presents His love and there is rebuke. But see, the thing is, is that there's always an invitation with God. It's a come and knowing that you'll never leave the same. In Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, this is Isaiah saying, Here I am, send me. And so begins Isaiah's ministry. How many of us can say, here I am, send me, and we can go, there's the start. There's the start of the ministry. You know that the ministry doesn't always mean that it's right here. Sometimes the ministry is exactly the person sitting next to you. Sometimes it's that person that you see that you don't know their name. And sometimes it's just a spoken word. Sometimes it's just a smile. Sometimes it's just a a hug. You know, early, early on, I struggled with what it looked like. Um, just to share with you just a little bit, I was raised in, in the church all, all my life, but um, I was raised in what I would consider my mom and dad's church. And then by the time I was 18, I started having my own relationship with God and then decided that that wasn't the way that I wanted. I wanted a true heart relationship with God. Not anything that was on the outward appearance, but it was something that was on the internal part of me. But early on in my younger years, my idea of ministry had, was boxed in. And I used to struggle with that because I'm like, well, what's my ministry? Anybody ever struggle with that? We can say so. We can say so. But you know what it was is that early on God started, um, showing me that ministry looks a little different. And, you know, I'm in the fitness business and that's a ministry in itself. If you wonder why my voice is a little crackling or a little bit, I talk a lot daily. Okay, I yell a lot. I yell a lot. Um, But I have recognized over years and years when I did it and I started it out, it's like, okay, I have a passion for fitness. And then it became, okay, I have a a passion to start the business. And then I started a business and then it became a, a, like the light bulb hit. And it was like, oh, this is my ministry. Oh, I'm reaching people and I'm actually, I'm helping them out. You know, the scripture that talks about our bodies being our temple. I wholeheartedly believe that. When we talk about being spiritually fed, but also at the same time, our physical, I I 100% tie the two together. And I started recognizing that that was a ministry, that it was getting, it was reaching into families. At first, my business, oh man, early in the 2000s was just moms. And their, and their babies. And then it turned into Saturdays, the dads would come. So then I had an insight into their families. I got to be around for a lot of the first person being told about being pregnant. I also got to be the first person that was told when there was a miscarriage. But I also got to be the first person to pray with them and uplift them and get to share in not only the disappointments, but to get to share in the promises of, of seeing that God will still provide for you. God still knows your heart. God still understands. And then I get to be a part of the family. I get to see couples that were separating and coming like they're drawing apart, but I also got to see God's reconciliation and bringing them together. Maybe it was in a family class on, on a Saturday, but it was bringing them together. And I started recognizing that that's a ministry. And today I no longer just do moms. I do single and I do couples and, and it's, it's, all, all ages. But what I recognize on, on a daily basis is that I get to speak into these people. When they come into the studio, they don't know that I've been praying for them. They don't know that I've been, been playing the worship music prior to. They just come in and go, why do I feel so at peace? They don't understand that when they come in and they just start like telling me everything that went on and they're like, I don't know why I just said this. And I was like, I know it's okay. Or why my arms are open and I have tears on my shoulders from them crying and going, why did I just hug you like that? It's okay. 
But that's a ministry. And what I'm sharing with you tonight is that it doesn't have to look like what we think it should look like. That wherever you are, God places people. He places your family. He places your spouse. There are places that you go day in and day out that he is calling you to. That there is a word that you have for them. There is a spirit that you bring, which is the spirit of God, which is Jesus in us. We are the kingdom of God. So if we do not go anywhere, where will the kingdom of God go? So when you are thinking about it and when you are struggling with it, I want you to remind yourself, I am the kingdom of God. And take ownership when you walk into a place. So we'll go, we'll go into Isaiah 7 where he starts prophesying about Jesus about not just Jesus, but he prophesies about Jesus being born of a virgin. Why is that such a, a integral part? Moms, come on. You know that you cannot have a baby, right? So it, 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 you know where I'm going. It, it had to be a sign of something that was impossible, but we know with God all things are possible. So we'll pick up in Isaiah 7, 10, and it says, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, this is the king, and he says, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether you're in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Here's the thing that we have to understand is it doesn't matter if we're in the lowest valley or we're the, in the highs of the highs of life. There is still a call that we can come to our father and ask, amen? But he asked him, this is Ahaz's uh, response, he says, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. And Isaiah says to him, hear now you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. There's the two, the southern and the northern. He will bring the king of Assyria. Here you see Isaiah was speaking to the house of David, which is the royal line of David. And God was responding to Ahaz in indignation. Ahaz, who was a wicked and petty and arrogant king who dared to refuse the Lord. He would not trust in God even when he was surrounded by his enemies. He was a prideful king. But let me tell you this, that God has a perfect plan. There there is an ask that we can have of our father. There is, we can, you know, I, I have said this before and I live by this, but I pray for every decision. Every decision that we've made, we've always prayed for, Lord, what is your will? Lord, is this what we're supposed to do? And and that is even about different uh, buying a house, not buying a house, buying a car, not buying a car, uh, what we spend on, what we don't spend on. There has always been an ask, "Is is this yours? Is this the right thing? We can ask because God has a plan. And the thing is too, he also wants to give us the desires of our heart. And it's not bad to take those desires and, and say, Father, is this the right desire? Should I have this? Should it be changed? Do my desires align with your desires? See, King Ahaz, he wasn't interested in any of that. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to do it his way. And Isaiah here is speaking of a sign, but he wasn't just trying to get Ahaz's attention. He starts speaking now to the people and saying, okay, I'm giving a sign, not just for you, King, but I'm giving for the people. He just bypasses 
He says, okay, the king's not wanting to hear. Okay, I'm gonna start talking to, I'm gonna start talking to everybody. But to pull out on verse 14, when it says the Lord himself will give, this adds an absolute certainty to the impending sign. What's the sign? That I'm bringing a Messiah and that he's gonna be born of a virgin. Moving into Isaiah 9, Isaiah is giving warning to the northern and the southern, right? We, we understand that the houses of, of Israel were looking for answers and solutions because their trust in God had wavered. Sometimes, have you ever looked outwardly for an answer instead of upward? I, I mean, we do, you know, it's okay. We look at the stock market sometimes to see any of you that invest, yeah. We, we look at other outward to try to get what we should be looking upward for decisions. You know, there is too much reliance sometimes. And this is where, where you're seeing in Isaiah with the, the northern and the southern houses of Israel is that they were having too much reliance on Israel and Samaria. And, and the result was going to be destruction. I can say today that I want to look upwardly so that I can make sure that there's no destruction in my life. Amen? Israel was forming partnerships with those outside the covenant. They were looking for their answers and their solutions because their trust wasn't in God. You got to be careful of the partnerships and you got to be careful of looking outside the covenant for your answers and your solutions, because that will take you outside of the trust of God. You start to waver in it, because you know what? There, there are those people that would be like, well, do you really believe? Do you really think God will? How long are you going to wait on God? How long are you, Telly says, well, how long is that? Don't know. Can't you put a timeline on it? No. Don't you want to? No. Come on, there's got to be some people that have heard that a little bit. But you you got to watch who you're, you're partnering with, who you're putting your, your partnerships and your word into. Where are your covenants with? Are we putting our trust in God and the partnerships that he calls us to? Are we putting our conversations in, in the right places? Or are we just wanting to find a person that we can whine with. And then now we've got a whole orchestra. <laughs> Some of you are getting it. Some of you are getting it. Okay. The whine. Yeah. You get more people. And then next thing you know, you've got the symphony. Okay. Th that's not what we're called to do though. We're not called to like whine to one another, but we're called to grab the partnerships that God has called together and the covenant. I always hear this from Pastor G and D is that we vent upwards. We never vent downwards or vent this way. Unless your husband and spouse. <laughs> Other end, sometimes you vent it upwards too. But see, during all of this, during seeing the nations, they're struggling and Isaiah's giving them warnings Here's the thing, let us be a people that is willing to let God lead us because that's his desire. You know, it's God's desire to lead you. It's, it's God's desire to direct your paths. It's God's desires, right? To lead you by the still waters. It's God's desire to be with you. We got to remember that he is all knowing. We're not all knowing. We like to think we're all knowing, but we're not all knowing. Come on. You know that some of us do that. We like, for some of us brain people, we like to think that we're the all knowing, but here's the deal is God is the master of everything, everything. Isaiah stayed true to God's word, even though the people were irritated because his focus was not the same as theirs. Let me just encourage you tonight and tell you that it's okay to stand apart. It's okay to stand out. 
It's okay to be the light in the darkness. It's okay to be the salt of this world. We are not called to blend in. We are not called to be, you know, the, looking like the person next to us. We're called to stand out. We're called to be different. Isaiah was okay with that. He had to be. That was his call. Guess what our call is? Yeah, to stand out, to not be popular sometimes. But you know what? When we come in the midst of each other, you know what? We can be popular together. No, no, come on. When one or two are gathered, who's in the midst? There he is in the midst. That's where unity is. A three chord. Come on, right? Will not be broken. Yes. So we can be unpopular. You can, we can be popular together. So I have a few little foundational pillars that I want to give you tonight that you can just kind of take with you. And these are pillars that we can grab hold of from Isaiah. So the first one is ears to hear. Ears to hear. So in Isaiah 28, verse 23, it says, listen and hear my voice. Pay attention and hear what I say. So ears to hear, listen to the teaching of God. It'll, it'll save some of us. <laughs> it'll, it'll equip some of us. How many of us have kids? How many of you don't want them to go through the same struggles that you went through? Hallelujah. Amen, right? So what we do is we heed to the will of God. We heed to his word. So what does that mean? Is that we have to have ears to hear. Spiritual ears. That it's tuned to God's voice. But not just tuned to God's voice, but tuned to his ways. Tuned to his will. Because sometimes it's not our ways and sometimes it's not our will. And instead of us being in this jerk motion, how about if we just gently just go? so much easier. You don't get like whiplash. I'm just saying, I mean, like sometimes when you, God grabs a hold of us, you know, we get a little jerk and it would have been nice if it was just a little bit easier. But then the second thing is eyes to see. In 29 verse nine, it says, be stunned and amazed. Another translation says, pause and wonder. Can we just pause sometimes and wonder on the goodness of God? You know, there, there's what we call Mariah moments, that when God has shown up in your life, that you actually mark it, that there is a Mariah moment that you can go back five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I'm not aging myself, and you can go that moment right there, that's my Mariah moment, God showed up for me. So we pause and we wonder. He's saying, be stunned and amazed. Blind yourselves and be sightless. Be drunk, but not from wine. Stagger, but not from beer. The Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads. See, it's not talking about a, a physical drunkenness, but it's, it's a drunkenness from the ignorance of the Lord and his way. So what am I saying tonight? I'm saying let's have spiritual eyes that we see what God wants. Not that we're spiritually blinded. Could you imagine if we were all spiritually blinded and we're just like trying to find our way, bumping in here, bumping in there. Instead, like when we have the spiritual eyes that God wants us to have, we can see exactly where we can go. We can know exactly which direction. When we come to a T, we know without a shadow of doubt it's right. And we don't even have to question it's left. We just know that that's God's way because we have eyes to see. It says it covered their head. That means the visions that God was giving them were not appreciated or obeyed. God speaks to me in visions a lot of times, not dreams, but visions. I'll see things and then I'll, I'll start to recognize God's, God's will in it or God's way. But what he's doing is he's allowing you to have visions so that you can see and obey. He doesn't give you a vision just so you can sit on it. 
but he gives you a vision so that you can chase after it. You know what follows vision? Provision. So when you see vision that God has given you, provision will always follow vision. So no matter what you see and it seems too far, too impossible, God will always provide for what he shows. So let us be a people that know and embrace God's way so that we follow after his vision and obedience and not our own agenda. The third thing to, to rely on and to, and to grab hold of is God's words. In 29, 13, it says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What's the warning for us? That our mouth and our lips would speak the right thing. That our inner nature, the heart is for God, that it's not, a far, it's not far from him. In our household, we have a saying that we always say, a good thing is not always the right thing. Because doing a good thing may not be the right thing. And so we really challenge ourselves to make sure that whatever we do, that it's not just a feel good is what I mean. Sometimes doing a good thing makes you feel good, but doing the right thing sometimes doesn't feel good. Anybody know what I mean? Like doing the right thing sometimes comes with a suffer. Doing the right thing sometimes comes with a sacrifice. Doing the right thing says, I'll give it all away. A good thing would be I'll give a hundred, but you have 200 in your wallet. Hundreds mine. No, the right thing is I told you to give them 200. It's amazing how God's word is because when he says it, guess what you have? Exactly what he asked you to give. Amen. I know we've, I know we've been there. I know we've been there. The next foundation piece is returning towards God. Returning towards God. In 30, 15, it says, for the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, you will be delivered by returning and resting your strength will lie in quiet confidence, but you are not willing. Returning here is talking about repentance. It's the change of mind, and then we turn the other way. Maybe there's a situation in your life that has you bitter towards. Maybe you didn't fully agree with what God said. And all you need to do is just repent of it and then turn back to it doesn't mean that you're lost. It doesn't mean that you're a sinner. It just means, you know what, there's something that's just keeping me from just fully getting that rest that I'll find when I return my ways towards God. Just repenting of it. It's just a simple returning to God. And in the same, same verse, thirty fifteen, the next one is rest. In God. It says that there's a quiet and a confidence that might be rephrased as utter trust. Trusting in God's strength instead of our own is the only way that we can find true rest. We were talking about peace tonight. Peace. That the only way that we can really understand peace is that no matter what the circumstances around us, what, whatever the storm is that you are, are going through, some of our storms are waves of 50 feet and other storms are winds of 60 miles per hour. But whatever your storm is, you still can find peace because you know that you can be still and know that he is God. That's where you find rest is when you find that moment where there's the confidence that you have, but there's the quietness. That's the stillness of the spirit, the peace that just causes you just to, just to be. It says in Psalms 46, one through two, God is our refuge and our strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. When? In times of trouble. How often? Always. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Sometimes, most of the time, or all the time, we don't have to be afraid. 
be bold and courageous. We should know that, right? We've been hearing that a lot from Pastor G is being bold and courageous. Joshua 1.9, it should be just an implant on your heart. Be bold and courageous. It says, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you in some of the places you go. Okay, you're awake. Okay, just check it. Wherever you go, be strong and courageous. Can I tell you, though, that sometimes being strong and courageous doesn't mean being loud and boastful? It, it's, a, it's a flip of our mindset. Sometimes we think bold and courageous is, hey, me, over here, the one that walks and the one that follows God, you have to do. No, 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 no. Be bold and courageous means I'm going to stand on his word. And no matter what is coming my way, I'm not moved. I'm unshakable. That's being bold. The next one is walking in the spirit. In verse 21 of chapter 30, it says, whether you turn to the right, to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. There, there is a call for us to walk by the spirit. Anybody know the fruits of the Spirit? I didn't give you the scripture, but you could, put, you could put it up there. Some of you may want to jot it down. But we are supposed to walk in it. In Galatians, you guys got it? Five. Maybe. I'm sorry I didn't give it to you. It's okay. But some of you guys can get it and, then, and memorize it because that is what we, we embrace. That's what we live by. We, we live by love. We live by patience. We live by long suffering. We live by. So we walk, it, we walk by the spirit. So let's just, let's recap. It's ears to hear because the people in Israel didn't have those ears. Their, their ears were covered to the things of God. Eyes to see. Their eyes were, had a spiritual blindness. They didn't see what God was doing. Remember, this is the same people that God brought them through. He, the same people God brought them through the Red Sea. The same people that he did all the wondrous works for. But here's the thing. God's done wondrous works for each and every one of you. You're here today. God's done a, a work for you. So we, we have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. And we implant God's word on our heart. We implant that. We return towards God. We just che check. It's just a little mental check. Every now and then, don't we have to do a mirror check? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you would never get your hair cut. You would never trim your beards for the guys. You would never, girls, check our eyebrows or all this. Thing. We do a little mental, like, mirror check, okay? That's what I call it, mirror check. We check ourselves out. But there is a spiritual check that we have to do. Like, we have to check in that inward part. Not on the outwardly part, but the inward part. Lord, what is it that I need to be checked on? What is it that I need to be cleansed of? Anybody get the tweezers out? What is it that I need to get plucked? What is it that I need to trim? What is it that needs to be pruned off? That's a spiritual just check in. And we can know when we do all of these, we have rest in God by walking in his, in his spirit. Amen. I'm just going to uh, highlight just a couple things and then I'm going to, I'm going to start to start to close. But I, I wanted to, you know, when I was studying this evening, I say this evening, the day and over the last couple of days, I was like, how am I going to bring all of these 60 some chapters? And so I kept just, I kept digging in and I kept digging in and I have 
a, a notebook, how I kind of prepare is I write. I, I don't type until I have all my notes and then I get it ready and I'm typing out an outline. But I had all these handwritten notes. And if you were reading it, you were probably like, what in the world? And there was arrows here and there. And I was just like, God, what is it that you want me to bring? We know that Isaiah has a great word because it has the prophecy of Jesus. And it tells us all of these things. But what is it that we can take out and that we can apply to our life? And that's where God started showing me and he started just almost removing some of the other stuff so that I could just hone in on some of the, okay, this is what's applicable to us today. This is what we can do in our, in our lives. But I don't want to get away from still pointing our eyes to the cross, still pointing our direction back to Jesus. Because here, we can't do any of those foundational pieces without being the ultimate servant, just as Jesus was the ultimate servant. Amen? So in Isaiah 42, it says this, This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. We're talking about Jesus here. Jesus wasn't the one hollering in the streets, but he was the one that just simply would go and pick up the mud and put on the eyes and they saw. He didn't have to proclaim to everybody. He, in fact, he's the one that said, shh, don't say anything. Shh, not yet, not yet. But we're talking about who our, our Jesus is. He will not grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. The coast and islands will wait for his instruction. This is what God the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people, a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in the darkness from the prison, prison house. I am the Lord. This is my name and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. The past have, events have indeed happened, but now I declare new events. I announce them to you before they occur. This is what we're talking about, Jesus, the servant who was the ultimate service servant. What did Jesus say? I don't come to be served, but I come to serve. This is where we get the character of who Jesus is, but the character that we are called having Jesus in us. This is the nature of Jesus. It's his desire for us to be this. It's in the New Testament talks about Jesus being the chief servant. He says, the spirit is upon me. He didn't complain. He didn't whine, but he served. He didn't serve and go away and then talk about it. He just served and went away and rested and prayed so that he could do it again. And then he did that rest and pray so he could do it again. How much more should our example of how we live so that we can be established in having ears to hear, eyes to see? Right? We can't have those foundational pieces unless we understand the character of Jesus, the servant. Here's how the servant would actually praise. In verse 10 of the same chapter, it says, Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praise from the ends of the earth. You go down to the sea with all that fills it. Your new coasts and islands with your inhabitants. Let the desert and its city shout. The settlements where Keter dwells cry aloud. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them cry out from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coast and islands. The Lord advances like a warrior. He stirs up his zeal like a soldier. He shouts and he roars aloud. He prevails over his enemies. 
I have kept silent from ages past. I have been quiet and restrained myself, but now I will groan like a woman in labor, gasping breathlessly. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up marshes. I will lead the blind by a way they did not know. I will guide them on paths they have not known. I will turn darkness to light in front of them and rough places into level ground. This is what I will do for them and I will not abandon them. They will be turned back and utterly ashamed. Those who trust in an idol and say to a cast image, you are our God. This is the servant song. Can we implant that on us? What a praise that we could have on our, on our lips. And then it goes into, and we're going to be ending here in uh, chapter 43. It says, now this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. We're talking about our redeemer now. Who's our redeemer? Jesus. He says, I have called you by name. Can you say your name real quick? Just say it. Miss you. He's called you by your name. And he says, you are mine. That means he's protecting you. He says, when you pass through the waters, remember the Red Sea? Some of us go through moments that, you know what? God's holding back the sea. It may not look like how it did back then, but God holds back the seas for our life. There's situations that I'm sure each and every one of us has faced that we know that God held back so that we could walk through. He says, I will be with you and the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. Can you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Not a a scent of fire on them. Sometimes we go through things that feel like we're going through the fire, but when we come out, we don't have no burn marks on us. We're not singed. Our clothes don't smell. He's saying, don't worry. That flame will not burn you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Seba in your place. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations instead of your life. Do not fear, for I am worth you. All he's doing is calling us to worship him for he who created us. And we were created to what? Worship. Because if we don't worship, what's it say? Even the rocks will cry out. That's, that's the good news that we can pull away from Isaiah. The good news of Jesus, the character and the nature of him and how we can walk ourselves. Amen. You know, I have a couple more pages, right? (laughs) I just thought I'd throw it out. No, God is good. Let, let, you know what, let's, let's stand this evening and let, let us just, you know, let's take some of what what was spoken tonight. And, and if, it, if it did actually just any one of those things, if there is a moment where you're like, you know what, Lord, ah, you know, I think my hearing's good, but my seeing needs to be better. Or maybe I need to just, I need to just kind of check on some things. I need to just do that spiritual mirror check. Can you just kind of poke and prod gently? I'm speaking on your behalf gently and just if there's something I need to return myself back to so that I can, I want you to leave the place with rest. I want you to leave the place with peace. See, we don't come here so that you can leave the same way when you walk out. We come in here so that you lay it down before him and that when you walk out the doors, you don't pick it back up. He says, my burden, my yoke is easy. 
So we don't leave the place the same way we came in. We leave it different. But different means we can leave with a little bounce in our step. We can leave with just a little bit of a, 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 it's turned up just a little bit of smile on us. We can leave knowing that God is like right here, right now for me. Lord, right now we just lift up to you each and every one that is here tonight, each and every one that is online with us tonight, Lord. Lord, we ask that all of the needs that are spoken right now, every prayer, it doesn't fall on deaf ears, Lord, for you hear every request. You hear every need. You hear every call. Those that, Lord, you may be calling back to you right now. Maybe you're in here and maybe you're online. Maybe you hear this later on, but there's a pull and God is calling you back to him. And all you have to do is say, Lord, I'm yours. Lord, you are my savior. You are my Lord. Lord, govern my life. Lord, let me have the ears to hear what you have to say of my life. Not what others say of my life, but what you have to say. Lord, open my eyes so that I see what you see. That I don't see what only I can see, but I see what you see in me. Lord, I repent of anything that took me away from you, that turned my heart away, and I ask that you bring me back to you. Lord, let me find rest in your peace. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Lord, I ask that you would do this that's all you have to do. That's all you have to ask is just say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. For those in the house tonight, Lord, I ask that you would just cover them with a peace that when they walked in here, Lord, they may have come with a chaos. They may have come with a frustration. They may have come with an angst. But Lord, when they walk out of these doors, there is nothing that leaves with them but the peace that you bring, the love that you bring, the understanding that you bring, that we don't leave the same. Let your spirit rest on us. Let it embrace us. Lord, there are those that, are, that need your embrace. Those that need to just be hugged by you, their father. Lord, I ask you right now that you embrace them. You embrace them. That you just surround them with your, your love that only you, our Father, can give. Lord, you are great. You are mighty. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you hold us, that you carry us, that you lead us, that your desire for us is good. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Amen.